In this daily drop, we're going to dive more into the Aperture Storm ADC. So let's go. Okay, everyone, back here in the barn. And in this particular episode, bear with me. I'm going to geek out a little bit. And I would say that this is definitely a great example of we're learning together. I know a lot about lighting, but when it gets into the really geeky stuff, when we start to get into lots of acronyms and things like that, that's where you start to lose me. And there are a lot of really smart people out there who are trying to take LED lighting technology and improve upon it markedly, uh, make big strides in terms of the pain points that we have and have had with LED lighting for a long time. Now, I'm not saying in the last two to three years, there haven't been huge leaps. If I look back in terms of what's happened with the industry, we've had sort of the beginning of LED technology, which was less than precise overall. I remember the original light panels they effectively had to have some magenta component to those light panels in order to correct for shifts in terms of green. And we saw that in varying degrees from other manufacturers over the years. And then we've seen advancements. We obviously have had RGBW, red, green, blue, white, RGBWW, where you have two whites, which is going to produce, in theory, a better quality white light for what's being output and reflected off of objects and subject matter from the light fixture. And then companies like Hive, who came on with sort of the first idea of putting multicolor LEDs together to produce a better quality white and also color projected light. And then RGB ACL, red, green, blue, amber, cyan, lime. Another jump forward to being able to and produce a closer to accurate light quality to what we're used to using in production. And what are those things? Well, sort of in that warm color temperature area, we have tungsten incandescent light, right? So I sort of think of that in that low Kelvin range, maybe not going all the way down to 1800, but for me, it's sort of in that 2500 to 35 to 4000 Kelvin range. That's sort of that warmer light quality. And then especially as we start to get to about 5,000 Kelvin and 5,000 Kelvin and up, we're really in the daylight spectrum in terms of what we're doing and what we're using. And obviously there's mother nature. You look outside, you go outside and we have the sun and that's our primary source. There's a lot of things happening there in terms of what happens to our light. And many people, maybe not in our industry, but erroneously think that daylight has a particular set color temperature, which is probably around 5,600 to 6,000 Kelvin. But the true reality is, you know, we have our atmosphere, the way that light is coming through into and then being a part of our world. And the shifts in terms of what daylight color uh, temperature can be throughout a day are vast, far wider than that warmer color temperature range that I was talking about just a couple of minutes ago. So what all of these manufacturers are trying to do is they are trying to reproduce the most common types of light that we are working with in production, daylight being one of them, uh, artificial fixtures like HMIs being the probably most common historically daylight uh, producing light fixture out there. And then down in the warmer color temperatures, that tungsten incandescent light. In fact, if you took a quartz halogen lamp and you put that into a light fixture, uh, an RE or a Lowell or whatever it was, you put a new bulb in and you turn that fixture on, uh, you'd be pretty dead on probably at 3200 Kelvin and you would get full color spectrum in terms of the way it is producing light. So whether that's the projected white light in that warmer color temperature, uh, what the camera is actually seeing for the reflected light, 
these are the places that we're trying to go with LED lighting technology. So I think that we just have to have that, or I have to have that conversation with you as we start to talk about sort of the geekiness of all of this. And trust me, I don't understand about 95% of this. So I'm in a, it's like quantum physics, right? Can you ever really understand that? <laughs> I don't know if you can, but the reality is that there are people who do understand this. Uh, but to me, this is kind of like quantum physics. So ADC here, a color version of this. Now, let's just get the modifiers out of the way. When you buy this, you get a 35 degree reflector. We've got this positing, positive locking component here, and that's fine. And then they're also including this little plastic dome, which is obviously going to push the light in all directions. It's more frosted, and you can put that there. I wish that um, we could put an additional modifier on top of this because it's great for hotspots. But let me show you something, and this is just an idea. I'm not saying it's ever going to happen. Um, I'm going to take this off. There's four set screws that I have sitting here on this magnetic map right here, and a mat. And I'm going to switch live to the, the close-up of this. So let's just go ahead and do that. So there's this little uh, lens in front of the chip on board component here. So I'm going to just take that off so you can see it right now. And you will see inside of here what is effectively the Blair uh, CG, right, uh, component, because this is the color version of the, uh, you know, of the storm line. They have the X version, which is really designed just for white light reproduction, though using X, Y coordinates, you can absolutely create color with it. Um, so let's just talk about that. So inside of here with the color version, we have uh, the Blair base engine, right? Uh, and this is a light engine. There's a lot of things happening in terms of curves. And as you change correlated color temperatures and you switch between your hue, saturation, intensity. There's a lot of math uh, or maths being applied in order to, to make sure that the light output from here is the most accurate. And when it comes to color light, is the most saturated accurate light that you can get, at least today, in an LED. Um, it doesn't, by the way, discount other LED fixtures out there. We've made huge strides in the last few years having to do with that. So if you're using and have in rotation RGB WW lights, you have RGB ACL lights, they have hopefully a, a green magenta component to them to be able to shift that, not only to match other fixtures, tune your fixture, but really to match the overall um, you know, skew in the space, more green, more magenta. So when you're in post, you can adjust it all together. Um, when we when we talk about this sort of output and everything out of a fixture, it's just important to understand there's so many things going on, but what we're getting right now is really great light out of a lot of these. This is just, a, 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 I'm not going to say uh, a revolution, some might, but it's a big evolution in terms of getting us to the point where we're reproducing that uh, tungsten incandescent light, that warmer light, and that daylight spectrum light more accurately so that our cameras see closer to what we see with the human eye. So I hope that all makes sense. So um, let's just go ahead and take a look at this. So inside of here, we have the Blair engine, which is the blue, um, lime, amber, indigo. That's one of the most important ones that's getting us closer to all of this stuff that we're talking about. Uh, and then red. But in addition, with this particular fixture, the color versions of the storm fixtures, we're also adding the addition of cyan and green. And those two are really the other two components that are allowing us to get uh, much better um, projected, saturated color light. So the reason that the X versions only have Blair, the, you know, the blue, lime, amber, indigo, and red is because those are the, the mixtures or the, 
the LEDs, some with phosphor in front of them, some just colored diodes. Um, Cause usually the, usually the ones with phosphor in front of them are a version of a blue LED emitter. Um, but basically those five, the Blair engine is the basis for creating um, their version in the storm series of white light. So the 1200X just has those five. And then when we look at the ADC and the 1000C, we're adding the cyan and the green to basically produce a better projected uh, saturated colored light. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And they can play well with each other as well. Now there is that one indigo, which is a near UV output. And if, if I understand this correctly, if you think about the sun coming through the atmosphere and all of the things that happen there, the resulting uh, version of white light that we get from from daylight, from sunlight, is um, a little bit different in terms of what it is. So we have this uh, commission called the uh, the CIE uh, commission, which was uh, maybe still is a French commission that over the years is really a authority on uh, on light illumination and color and color spaces and things like that. And they created some baselines in terms of that part of the spectrum. So you hear about things like D50, 5,000 uh, Kelvin, basically D65, the white point that we use mostly for um, for our monitors and displays and things like that. So there's a rating there. And then there's this other thing uh, called the black body curve, which has to do with, and, and is always existent, but um, is most relevant to that incandescent, that tungsten incandescent range, that warmer light, right? So there's different ways that we're, we're rating things that are going on and happening. And, and that black body curve has to do with like, where is that white point uh, so that, you know, we're getting accurate light and how close is our fixture to producing that type of light on the black body curve and also uh, within these CIE, uh, which is the International Commission on Illumination Standards. Uh, so, so that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the goal here is to produce the best quality LED projected and reflected light so that it most closely uh, resembles the spectrum of what those traditional fixtures would give us, right? A tungsten fixture, uh, Mother Nature's Daylight, an HMI, so on and so forth. So that's what they're trying to do. And by the way, um, this thing that mixes these together, um, I'd love to see a, a dome diffusion version of this so that if I could put that on with the set screws, uh, maybe frosted, it would live inside of there. And that way when you're using inside of a... Uh, inside of a soft box, you're not going to get those hot spots in the middle. Um, but you get the basic idea of how this all works. And that's the inside of this fixture. When I turn this on, and right now I just have it um, at a, a 0.1%, I have this set right now to 3200 Kelvin. And it's basically the whole idea of this little lens here is it is diffusing and blending those different uh, Blair plus CG LEDs together so that it's going to produce the most accurate white light. Now that indigo component of it, that near UV component of it, is that secret sauce, especially when we're talking, I think I'm understanding this correctly, in the CIE range of things, the daylight spectrum of things. And that's really the difference between what's happening right now with the storm line, with the X and the C, um, is that what Tim and the Aperture team is trying to do is they're not just trying to match that black body curve. They're trying to make sure that they're, they're also looking at what happens in the daylight spectrum so that you're getting the best uh, and most accurate currently um, quality of light that you can get out of an LED chip on board fixture. Um, there's other ratings there. Like for instance, there's something called spectral similarity index. You may have heard of that SSI. Um, those readings for tungsten and for daylight are really designed for uh, a, a more accurate reading of modern LED fixtures so that when we're using something like a color meter like the C800, that we can read um, 
how close to that full spectrum we're getting for daylight and for tungsten. So we're seeing with this fixture here, sort of the mid to high 80s. And what does that mean in reality to you as an end user when you're using this fixture? Well, the light that it's producing is getting very, very close to especially our perception of uh, white light and colored light to to a much closer to full spectrum. And what does that mean? Well, if this light is producing that closer to what a traditional um, tungsten incandescent fixture would have done, or a daylight fixture would have done, or an HMI, which has its own problems, but that's a different conversation, then, then the cameras that we're using should be seeing a more accurate, more close to what we're seeing type of quality of light. Okay, so I know this is very talky here, but I think it's really important to understand that when we talk about a light engine and we talk about these mixtures of diodes and what, what is happening, that the end goal here should be to produce a quality of light that is projected and reflected off of things and then captured by cameras that is much closer to what we were getting previously or we are getting, for instance, out of sunlight, right? So sunlight or daylight is incredible spectrum of light and it has its own issues. Uh, again, a quartz halogen bulb, you know, in that tungsten incandescent realm is also amazing, full color spectrum. And we're just, we're just catching up here. But this is a big step. This is a huge evolution. And from what I'm seeing based on the quality of light, again, like I said earlier, it does not negate in any way the fixtures that you're using, especially if they're not very old LED fixtures and they are, let's say, RGBWW, RGBACL, they have green magenta shift. You can get amazing results. You can get very, very, very good quality white light out of a lot of the fixtures from different manufacturers. And what is it that we most care about? This right here, skin tone. So if we're, we're rendering skin tone well, but this is gonna be a jump in terms of that fluorescence, that indigo part of this, that near UV component of it, which is safe, trust me, I've talked to them about that. Um, then we're gonna see things like our reflected whites you know, in fabrics and, and objects being more accurate. The reflected light from the projected light when we're using this in color modes to be more accurate. And again, we want our cameras generally as a base point to see as closely to the way we see things. So fingers crossed, I think we're going in the right direction. So hopefully that class <laughs> makes sense. Feel free to ask questions because I'm still learning here. I'm still going down this rabbit hole and still trying to figure all of this out. But it's it's more important for me to understand the conceptual idea, how it's basically working, uh, than actually feeling like I know every single thing about this subject. These are tools that we're trying to use in production. And, you know, this is not an inexpensive fixture. There's a lot of R&D that's a part of this. Um, if I'm looking for lights that I'm just going to use for white light, I'm going with Blair, right, from, from Aperture specifically. Um, so right now that's just a 1200X. But if I'm looking for something that can give me the best projected and then reflected color and saturation, then that's where the color line comes in. So that 1000C for me at considerably more money than the 1200X probably wouldn't be on my radar right now unless I was going to rent that for a scene or for a project where I needed to fill large spaces with color. But the 1200X is going to be the workhorse and you'll still get color out of it, X, Y coordinates. You're just not going to get as accurate and as saturated a color as you would with the C versions. I hope that all makes sense. Interested to see how you feel about this and if you learn something. Of course, the goal here is always education on this channel. So yeah, there you go. Don't forget to and to, and I'll see you on the next episode of The Daily Drop.